Good morning. What's up, Challenge? You all can head to your seats. Unless you want to stand for the sermon, I'm good with that too. Hey, it's good to be here with you all again. I was here a couple years ago and I love Challenge. I'm thankful for it. Uh, you all are such an encouragement to me. My name is Eric Rivera. I am from Chicago. Any Chicagoans out here? Let's go, Chi-Town. Born and raised in the northwest side of the city. People say, okay, so where in Chicago? I'm like, I'm, I'm from the city itself. That's life for me. I've been married to my wife, Erica, for 21 years. And we've got, we've got three kids. My oldest, my daughter, Keziah, is 16 years old. She's entering her senior year of high school. Our son, Lucas, is 15. He'll be a sophomore. And our youngest, Levi, is entering into sixth grade. He's 11 years old. Hey, listen, I can feel the excitement in this room. And that, that gets me pretty excited. And so I want you all to know, as I preach God's word for here, here I, I welcome your responses. I, I welcome your, your engagement. You know, when I was a youth, the Lord really grabbed my heart at a youth conference, not too much different from this one. And at that point, he put me on a trajectory to serve him with all my life, with all the ups and downs that come here, and so that come with following him. But what I want to make, the point I want to make clear to you all this morning is I know that you are here today because Jesus wants you here today. Y'all with me here? You're here today because God wants you here today. Some of you are like, no, I, I came because I wanted to go to Kansas City. I, I wanted to come to the 90 plus degree blistering heat. Some of y'all are here today because of that cute someone who is in your youth group. And you're like, hey, a week in Kansas City, let's go. Some of you are here because your youth leader said, hey, you got to come. You're like, all right, I guess I can't say no. And I know some of y'all are excited about Jesus and you want to follow him. Our God has designed things in such a way that youth like you can make a difference in your communities. People like you can impact your school, inspire your family, and draw others to Jesus. As I mentioned, I'm from Chicago. I am a White Sox fan. That's good. I, I see there's some, there's some Kansas City Royals out there. I told some folks, I wear this jersey today not out of pride, but out of faithfulness. <laughs> My team is terrible, but I'm holding on, all right? Whenever you fly into or drive into Chicago at night, the downtown area is unmistakable. If you ever come to Chicago, our city, there's no better city. Our skyline is beautiful, and at night, it lights up in such a way that you can be 10, 12 miles out and you still can see the city. Flying in is beautiful as you see this metropolis light up the night sky. It is a visible city. It is a city that you cannot help but notice. This morning as I open God's word with you all, God wants you all to be like that in your communities, to be such a, a visible follower of Jesus that makes a kingdom impact in our world. And I hope and pray that this morning, no matter how young you are, no matter what your story's like, no matter what things have taken place in your life, that you would believe without a shadow of a doubt that God wants to use you to be a visible witness and to make a difference for his kingdom. No matter who you are, God can and will and wants to use you in this way. This morning, I'm going to be preaching from Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 16. I do want to invite you to meet me there. That's the address I'll be preaching from. So would you open your Bibles, use your app, whatever device you've got, and follow along with me as I read from God's Word, Matthew 5, 11 to 16. 
Let's see what God's word tells us. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. Can you say salt of the earth? You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. Can you say the light of the world? A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, in the same way, challenge, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I'm going to pray and dive into this text together. Lord God, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us here this morning, for waking us up. God, I thank you for these precious youth that are here, these young people, these young men, young women, people who've come for all kinds of reasons, but Lord, I know you want them here because you want to use them to make waves in your kingdom, God. God, I know, I know you have plans for them. And I pray that this morning you would set aside distractions, that, that you would cut through whatever reasons they might want to prop up to believe that they are beyond your usage. I pray you would inspire them, God. And Lord, I pray that today that they would leave with a deep yearning to be salt, to be light, to bring you glory. I do pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, last night you all were introduced to this amazing sermon of Jesus from Matthew chapters 5 to 7. We affectionately know it as the Sermon on the Mount. It's here that Jesus instructs his followers what it's like to be a disciple. To hold on to the promises of now, though many of their realizations will be later. How to live in the already, but in the not yet. You all saw last night what it means to be blessed in God's economy. The blessed people, the humble in heart, those who follow him with faithfulness. The last of the Beatitudes in verse 10 tells us about being persecuted for righteousness' sake. And as we look at verse 11, Jesus said, you are blessed if people reject you for following Jesus, even if they utter all kinds of insults at you because of your faith. He goes on to say in verse 12 that when that happens to you, you can actually rejoice and be glad Because in your faithful living out of your faith, you are aligning yourself with the people of God who went before you, who also were persecuted for their faith. Now, if you're like me, I read that and I say, that's cool. But man, Jesus, that's hard. It's hard to think about the fact that if I want to faithfully follow Jesus, there can and will come times when I feel rejected because of that, isolated, left out. And some of you are like, hey, I've experienced that already. And some of you are saying, I want to follow Jesus, but I'm afraid of experiencing that. What Jesus is saying is, when you live for him, that is a blessed life in his kingdom plans. There's a kind of joy, a kind of hope, a kind of peace, a knowing of forgiveness that comes of following him. But as we see this, I'm asking the question, Jesus, what does it look like 
to live out my faith in that kind of way. And it's almost like Jesus anticipates that question. It's almost like he knows everything. Surprise, surprise. And he goes on in verses 13 to 16 to lay out two metaphors, two examples of what it's like to live out your faith in a world that sometimes may be hostile to you being a Christian. And the first metaphor he uses is in verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Notice that. You are the salt of the earth. Now, in the first century, salt was used for a couple of different purposes. The first of which, it is often used as a preservative to prevent your food from spoiling. They didn't have refrigerators like we've got them. So they would rub their meat with salt in order for it to not spoil and not rot, and therefore salt functioned like a preservative with their food. We also like salt on our food as well to eat our food. Salt is a flavor. It adds something to what we're eating. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You, my follower, brothers and sisters, are like a preservative on this earth. You are like flavor on this earth. You are the salt of the earth. But notice how Jesus states that. You are the salt of the earth. Now, if you know your your uh, literature class, you know this is a figure of speech. It's a metaphor. It's a comparison without using the words like or as. Some of you all are beasts on the basketball court. I'm not saying that you've got like long nails and all this hair and fangs and stuff like that. It's a metaphor. Ladies, when a guy says you're an angel, he's not really thinking you fell from the heavens and are an angelic being. It's a metaphor. And what Jesus is saying is, you are salt of the earth so that you would know that this saltiness is part of your spiritual DNA. It is part of the makeup of who you are. So what does it mean then to be salty on earth, family? Well, a lot of those things were already laid out for us. Salty Christians make a difference on this earth as they are meek and humble, as they hunger and thirst for righteousness, as they show mercy to others, as they are pure in heart, as they make peace. The calling that Jesus has for you all is that you would be like this on our earth. That when people around you see your hope in Jesus, they would understand that through your actions, your life is in God's hands. They they would understand that you got a peace because you know God's in control. That's what saltiness is like. That you understand that you're forgiven no matter how much you've messed up. That you've got a lasting joy that no one can take away from you. And people will see this kind of saltiness in your life. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. It's a kind of peace that no one else and nothing else can duplicate. It's a kind of hope that the world cannot emulate. It's a kind of joy that the world cannot imitate. It's a kind of purpose that the world cannot replicate. You are a salt of the earth. And when people see your faith in you, they are drawn to that. And they are going to say, I don't know what it is you've got, but I want some of that. Let me illustrate it for you this way. You ever gone to a nice restaurant and you know the food is good and the waiter hands you the menu and there's like 50 options and you're there looking at your menu and you're a bit overwhelmed because like, this is my shot to get that perfect dish. Y'all been there with me ever before? And as you're, as you're looking through the menu, you're starting to get hungry, your mouth's starting to water, but you're reading the menu descriptions and you're like, I don't know what that is. I, I'm not sure what I want. I don't want to get the wrong thing. And then suddenly the waitress walks past you 
and there's a dish in her hand. And as she places it on the table next to you, you think, that's it. That, that's what I'm getting. It's almost like the taste buds, the, the flavors, I'm sorry, of that food are jumping off the plate and flying through the air into your nostrils. You know what that's like? You, you see the, the food well plated, the aroma. You may be hearing a little bit of the crackling of it still as it's warmed up. And you think, that's, that's what I'm going to eat. And here's the beauty. You haven't tasted it. It hasn't entered your mouth, but you know from what you see that that's going to be something that's worthwhile. Look at challenge. When Jesus is calling us to be his representatives in this world, to make, to be a visible difference, he's saying people are going to see you and they may not know exactly what it is about you that gives you your joy and your hope and your peace, but they're going to say, man, I don't know what you've got, but I need some of that in my life. I need some of that with me. Jesus says, you are, verse 13, the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Once that happens, salt isn't good for a thing. Now, here's an interesting thing. People will tell you that salt actually cannot cease to be salty and remain salt. So it's like Jesus is saying, if salt can lose its saltiness, it loses what it ultimately is. It's, it's very makeup is lost. Therefore, that can't happen. What I love about Jesus' statement here is that what he's saying essentially is, as a follower of Jesus, you can't help but be salty because that's part of who you are. It reminds me of a story of a young lady named Perpetua. She lived in the late 190s AD. And Perpetua one day came to faith in Jesus Christ. She heard the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for her sins. She wanted to follow him with all her life. She lived in a day in the Roman Empire where Christianity was not legal or accepted. Perpetua was arrested, imprisoned for her faith, and was prepared to suffer execution for following Jesus. She wrote a journal during the final days of her life. And at one point, her dad came to visit her in prison. And her dad begged her, Perpetua, please offer sacrifices to the Roman emperor. Please, that's all you've got to do, and they will release you. And her dad would plead with Perpetua to please, you don't have to renounce your faith, just, just offer sacrifices to the emperor, and you could be home with us again. Perpetua wrote in her journal that she told her dad, she said, see, see that vase over there? There was a vase in the corner. Her dad looked at the vase. He says, Father, can that thing be called anything other than what it is, a vase? And her father looks at her and says, no. She says, well, neither can I be called anything other than what I am, a Christian. In the year 203 A.D., Perpetua was sent into the arena where wild animals and beasts attacked her for her faith as she was set there for her faith and ultimately was executed by an ex executioner. Perpetua understood that being a follower of Jesus was an essential component to who she was. In that same way, what Jesus is saying is, when you place your faith in him, you are the salt of the earth. Not you will be, you might be, it's going to happen at some point. It's who you are. And Jesus wants to raise visible 
followers like you who will make a difference for his kingdom. Saltiness. But saltiness is not just the character qualities that we've got. Being a visible witness is not just that, but it's also the life that we lead, the things that we do, the way that our faith is lived out. Look in verse 14. Jesus says, you also are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Jesus says, yes, on the one hand, you are salt, and that's part of your makeup, but, but you're also light in the middle of darkness. And that kind of light cannot be hidden. In fact, when Jesus comes on this earth, he says in the book of John, I am the light of the world. John chapter 1 verse 5 says that when, when Jesus' light entered, the darkness could not push him back. And look, y'all, we live in a dark world, don't we? Your schools are dark. Your communities are dark. Online is dark. And there's so much brokenness around us. But Jesus says, you are not darkness. You are light. It also, like saltiness, is part of your spiritual DNA. Therefore, wherever you go, you bring the light of Jesus with you. Just imagine if someone comes over your house one day, and they come to your living room, they acknowledge that it's a bit dark in there, they see your sofa, they see your coffee table, they see your TV, and in the corner of the room, they see a tall box, about, about this tall, about yay wide, and they ask you, what's, what's in the box? And you reply to them, it's not what's in the box, it's what's under the box. And they're like, okay, so, so what's under the box? And they say, it's my lamp. You look around the room, it's pretty dark, and why is your lamp covered? Is it because it's an ugly lamp? And you say, no, I, I love it. It's a, it's a beautiful lamp. Is it because you don't like the lamp? No, actually, I love the lamp. It was a gift given to me. It's beautiful. In fact, when the, light, when the lamp is on, it brightens my day. It makes me happy. And they're like, but why is your lamp covered? Well, what would you re reply to them? Because it doesn't make sense. Why would you cover something that brightens a dark space and brings you so much joy? And Jesus is saying here, you are the light of the world. Your faith is your light. Your belief in Jesus is your light. And as we put our faith in Christ, we know that he brings us joy. He brings us hope. We know that in him we have purpose. He brightens our day. Why would we keep our faith hidden? There's nothing better than knowing Jesus. And so what does it mean then to shine your faith? Well, Jesus says here, nor do people, in verse 15, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light, let your faith shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Look, challenge, what Jesus is saying here is that your faith is made visible not just in the character saltiness you've got, but also in the good things that you do. What Jesus is saying is, good works are the fruit of a life of faith in him. When you show kindness to that classmate who often looks sad, that's letting your light shine through good works. When you talk with that person and include them into your, that, that teammate who feels often excluded, when you, when you include them, that's 
letting your light shine in good works. When you don't retaliate with that person who's just so mean. When you're generous with your money and your resources in order to help others out, that's letting your faith shine through your good works. When you choose to give an encouraging text, that Bible verse to that other person in your youth group who you know is struggling. See, these are different ways our faith can shine through our good works. But Jesus is telling us that we ought to do this, which means that there are things sometimes that prevent us from letting our light shine, from being like a city on a hill. What are those things that prevent you from shining? You say, I got in my hand right here a glow stick. You all know how this works, right? How do I get this thing to light up? I, I got to crack it, don't I? Do you know why that makes it light up? You ever think about that? I hear whispering. I'm going to assume someone said, that's, that's chemiluminescence. That's what it is. Yes. And actually what's happening is there are two different liquids in here. There is a liquid inside the glow stick, but inside of the glow stick, there's another tube that has another liquid. And when you bend this thing, you are breaking the inner tube so that the two liquids can now come together. And then what do you got to do? Shake it, give it a good shake. So that these two liquids can come together. Voila, the light is shining. This light will not shine until something in here has to break. But once that thing breaks, the two liquids mix together. You see, what Jesus is telling us is that when you place your faith in Jesus, that's amazing. Praise God. But your faith will produce good works as well so that that light of your faith shines in the world around you. But listen up. Sometimes we keep our faith silent. We cover our lamp because there's something holding us back from living out that faith. Now, I don't know what it is for you, but my hunch is you know what it is for you. You know what it's like to turn on your lamp in your house and say, this light is awesome. I love Jesus. I praise God. But when someone comes over, I feel tempted to cover it. When I go into dark places, I'm tempted to cover it. Maybe you're afraid of being rejected for your faith. That persecution Jesus talked about. Maybe you're afraid like someone's going to ask me questions and I haven't got answers. Maybe you just don't know, but you're like, I just feel hesitant. It's not my personality. And there are reasons we have. And what Jesus wants to do, even here at Challenge this week, is to break some of those excuses, some of those reasons, some of those things that are holding you back so that the faith you proclaim can mix with the works that Jesus wants to produce in you so that your light shines here in Kansas City today, tomorrow, so that your light shines in your youth group when you head back home. So that your light can shine back in your school, back in your household, on your sports team, with your acting team, with your dance class, wherever you're at. Because Jesus wants your light to shine. Put aside the fear. Let your light shine. But where are we letting it shine? Before others, so they may see your good works and then give glory to your Father who is in heaven. At the end of the day, we shine our lights not so people can be impressed with us. We shine our lights not so that people can say, man, that's really bold of you. We shine our lights because we want people to know that there is a God who sees them and knows them. That there is a forgiveness he offers through faith in Jesus. A hope that he offers through faith in Jesus. Jesus wants to raise visible followers who will make a difference for his kingdom in the world. 
Y'all ever watch The Masked Singer? My kids are into it big time right now, watching all old seasons, new seasons, everything. But whenever the singer loses their competition, they tell them to take off their mask, and then a song plays. You know what song it is? Whose are you? Ooh, 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 ooh. Y'all know that? I'm not going to sing it for you. Today, more importantly than who are you, is what are you? What are you? Ooh, 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 ooh. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are a city on a hill. And before you can put up those excuses saying, I, I don't know if God could use me. I, I don't know if God, if, if God can work through the things I've done and where, what I've experienced and who I am or what's part of my story and my personality. Hold on a second. Let me tell you a story of something that happened not too long ago. We, uh, in our home, we have, this, we have our, our oven, and I went to make a pizza one day and realized our oven was broken. And I'm thinking, like, man, we haven't got money to call a repairer to come on in and repair something, but, but let me Google and find out what could be wrong. And through a series of searches and YouTube videos, I came to realize it was likely the igniter that had gone out in my oven. And the igniter piece is like $30. But to hire someone to replace the igniter is going to cost an additional $200 or $250 because it's going to be about like $300. Bucks. And so I'm like, yo, I got YouTube. I could do this. So I watched a number of videos, and I'm feeling pretty confident about my ability to repair the igniter of our oven. So I'm in the kitchen. I'm, I'm working the oven. I've, I've, I, I, it's dark in there. All right, so I put my phone light there. I light it up, and now I'm looking. I need a special screwdrivers to get in, and I finally get to the igniter piece way deep inside. I'm like, all right. I pull it out. It's actually working. I'm really impressed with myself. And even more special is my wife is watching me, and she's impressed with me. <laughs> and her love language is acts of service, so I'm really scoring big right now. So I'm there. I'm doing my little smile, working it saving us money, impressing my wife. I finished repairing the igniter. I'm like, now to find out if this thing works. I'm scared I'm going to blow up the house. I turn it on to 350 degrees, and guess what? It's working! Yes! But then, but then, let's try 450 degrees. That's how I bake my pizzas. Turn it up. I'm there. I should have had my fire extinguisher ready, which I didn't. I get to 450 degrees, and it's working. And my wife is looking at me like, mm-hmm, you did that, honey. I'm like, I sure did that, girl, yeah. <laughs> I'm super proud of myself. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to text my friend and tell him that. I'm like, Where, where's my phone? I look at my wife. She looks at me. She's like, no, you didn't. I open the oven and my case is dripping, and I'm like, are you kidding me? I saved 300 bucks, but I burned my $800 iPhone. <laughs> I get my oven mitt, I pull it out. This thing is like, scalding hot. It's the middle of winter. I throw it in my mailbox, which, which is on the outside wall, and I look at my wife, and like, I can't believe I did that. And all, all that pride she had was gone. I mean, it was gone. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I baked my iPhone to 450 degrees. About 10 minutes later, I go to the mailbox. It's still hot. But I pick it up and I'm like, this is ridiculous. I can't believe I did this. And then I thought, what if? I hold down my button and I see the apple. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding. I open my phone, I send a text to my wife, I call her, and my phone is still working. And I was like, won't he do it? I was giving God praise in that moment. 
And I still got that same phone to this moment. Okay, you're like, why does this have to, anything to do with what you're preaching? Listen here. That phone is a miracle. That phone escaped something that was impossible. Listen here. Sometimes we start thinking that God can't use us because of our personality, because of our story, because of our failures, because of something we've done. When God is like, look, if I redeemed you from the pit of hell through the death of my son on the cross and his resurrection from the grave and his ascension into glory, don't tell me I can't use you. Don't tell me you're beyond my usage. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are a city on the hill. And I made you the way you are to use you for my glory. And so if my iPhone can escape the clutches of my oven and God rescued it, and as he rescues you from the grip of death and sin and Satan to use you, don't tell God what he can or can't do in empowering you for his glory. Challenge. As we go on out today, this week, this month, next school year, I want you to know it's not who are you only that matters, that does matter, but it's also what are you. You are the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a city on a hill. You crossed over from death to life, old to new, flesh to spirit, born of the womb, born again of the empty tomb, born of your mom, but then born again of God. You were bound, but now you're free, and you're free indeed to be exactly what Jesus has made you to be, his representatives on this earth. You are a visible witness, and so go out and make a difference for his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the sweet reminders of who we are in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the ways that you have called us your own, empowered us for your glory. I pray for these youth, these young men, young women. God, I ask that they would see in these words that you have a purpose for them, to bring yourself, God, much glory as they are out sharing their faith, living out their faith, bearing the fruit of the Spirit in dark places. God, I pray that their friends would see them and say, man, I, I need some of that in my life. I pray that people would enter their world and say, you shine brightly. God, give them courage. Whatever things are holding them back, I pray that today they would realize, Lord, that you've got bigger plans for them and they'd be unashamed of the gospel. I pray this in Jesus' name.